Masteron thought it his duty to inform the commander of the English vessel of King Joachim's departure, but took care not to do so until the king's little fleet had got 48 hours start. Murat's intention was to land at Salerno, which is a port situated about 30 miles from Naples, where a considerable number of the old Neapolitan troops were being reorganized, but a storm having separated him from his flotilla, he made up his mind, instead of returning to Salerno, to rally the rest of his forces and to land immediately in the neighborhood of Pizzo. The Feluca on board, which King Joachim found himself carried about 30 old officers of his, amongst whom was General Franceschetti. This little troop at the head of which Murat placed himself in a general's uniform was specifically received by some coast guards who happened to be on the beach and who recognized King Joachim. They marched without loss of time to the town of Pizzo and entered the marketplace. Murat addressed the inhabitants who surrounded him and some saluted him as their king offering him horses which served to mount his troops, but the majority displayed timidity and hesitation. Joachim continued his march on the Montaloni without respite, the agent of the Duke de L'Infantado, who enjoyed great influence with the inhabitants on account of this Duke's immense possessions at Pizzo and elsewhere, addressed them after Murat's departure and threatened them with the vengeance of Ferdinand's government if they did not oppose the usurper's march. He even succeeded in making a troop take arms and placed himself at their head on this march. On Montaloni, King Joachim fell in with a colonel of gendarmerie named Trenta Capelli, who was on his way from Montaloni to Pizzo. Murat invited him to join them, but this officer, who had little confidence in resources so feeble for so great an enterprise, respectfully declined the offer. The colonel said, pointing to Montaloni, that he could only recognize as king the man whose flag should float on those towers. Trenta Capelli, whom the king had very imprudently allowed to continue his way to Pizzo, met the Duke de L'Infantado's agent there, urging the people to take up arms for King Ferdinand. The colonel added his efforts and the influence of his authority to the agent's exhortation. Then, placing himself at the head of a large troop, he marched rapidly in pursuit of King Joachim and came up with him very soon, about halfway to Montaglione. King Joachim and his friends, seeing the distance, imagined that they were coming to join them. Actuated by this idea, the king interrupted his march, thinking that it would be a good thing to await reinforcements before entering Montaglione. On the approach of this imaginary reinforcement, Mira walked a few paces towards this troop when some of his followers shouted out, Long live King Joachim! To their great surprise, this was answered with a discharge of musketry. A fierce encounter ensued, and the party of King Murat, who defended himself with the courage of despair, lost some men, and many were wounded, having to deal with an enemy numerically much superior and unable to advance on Montaglione with his enemies behind him. The king made up his mind to return to his ship and followed by General Franceschetti and a dozen others. He cut his way through the thick of his enemies, wounding several with his own hand and discharging his pistol point blank at Colonel Trenta Capelli, whom he missed. The vigor of his attack disconcerted the enemy and filled their ranks with confusion, of which the king took advantage to run to the place in the bay where he had left his ship. He had received no injuries, although all his comrades had been wounded. In the meanwhile, the commander of the expeditionary fleet, Barbara, a Piedmontese officer now in the king's service, having heard firing and considering his personal safety only or perhaps bought over by Ferdinand's agent, had left the coast, abandoning King Joachim to his fate. In this desperate situation, the king jumped into the water to reach a fishing boat which was within reach, followed by Franceschetti and the remainder of his followers. Fate would have it that this boat had unfortunately settled in the sand, and the united efforts of the fugitives to run it out into the sea were in vain. They then ran up to a smaller boat, which was within 20 paces, and meanwhile the coast was covered with the king's enemies, who watched them with astonishment without firing 
or without approaching them. To make matters worse, this little boat in which the king could have escaped his followers was chained to the shore, and all efforts to break the chain were fruitless. The fisherman to whom the boats belonged and who was perhaps afraid of losing his boat pulled at the chain, whilst another fisherman who had run up seized on the king, who with one blow in his head butted him into the sea. The example given by these two fishermen was followed by other assailants, and the boat was soon completely surrounded. No violence was committed upon the king, who stood up in the midst of his assailants, adjuring them to let him go, and as a last hope, showing them his passport for treatment. Finding them deaf to his appeals, Shoki was obliged to give himself up into the hands of his enemies. News of this important capture having been telegraphed to the Neapolitan ministry, an order was sent back by telegraph that a court martial should be called together to try and to sentence King Joachim. It is known how very expeditious was this trial. Nira listened to his sentence with a smile of contempt. He had written the following letter to his wife, enclosing a lock of his hair. My dear Caroline, my last hour has come. In a few moments, I shall have ceased to live. In a few moments, you will have no husband. Never forget me. Do not curse my memory. I die innocent. Farewell, my Achille. Farewell, my Leticia. Farewell, my Lucian. Farewell, my Louise. Show yourself worthy of me to the world. I leave you without a kingdom, without wealth, in the midst of my enemies. Remain constantly united. Show yourself superior to misfortune. Think of what you are and what you have been. God will bless you. Know that my greatest grief in the last moments of my life is to die far from my children. Receive my paternal blessings. Receive my kisses and my tears. And ever hold in your memory your unhappy father. Pizzo, October 13th, 1815. San Joaquin. King Mira declared that he died in the Roman Catholic religion and begged the assistance of a priest who comforted his last moments. He placed a portrait of his wife and his children on his bosom. And then refusing to sit down on the bench which was offered him or to allow his eyes to be bandaged, he himself gave the word to command to fire. And not a single muscle of his face betrayed that he felt the slightest emotion. Thus perished by an obscure death, a man to whom fortune, having taken him from a very lowly position, had reserved him the loftiest destiny. An intrepid soldier, frank, loyal, generous, throughout his whole career and on the throne, which he had admirably occupied, he had carried all these brilliant qualities to excess. Animated by too much confidence, he made peace with his enemies when he should have continued to make war and recommenced war when he should have maintained an expected attitude, which is what brought his ruin. Various letters which I had received recalled me to France. I myself felt the lack of information which was experienced there rendered my early departure necessary, and I accordingly made up my mind to ask for the necessary authorization for going there on April 9th. I begged the Empress to ask the Emperor of Austria to grant me a passport which could only be delivered with the special permission of this prince. After some very affectionate attempts to dissuade me from going, Marie Louise was good enough to promise to speak to her father on the subject. I awaited the result of this promise for some days, at the end of which the Empress told me that she had had great difficulty in getting the Emperor of Austria to allow me to go, and that before ordering a passport to be given to me, he wanted me to see Prince Metternich, and that I should be sent for at any moment by this minister. I resigned myself without reluctance to this delay. Have confidences? The variations in the language of the influential people with whom I was brought into contact, comparisons which I was enabled to draw, thanks to the role of observer to which I was reduced, the indefinite adjournment of the Emperor of Austria's departure for Prague, a whole concatenation of circumstances and indications had given birth to certain hopes in my heart which were unfortunately never to be realized. I had no doubt that some event or other was being waited for. It may be one of those lightning strokes to which the Emperor Napoleon was so accustomed. 
which might encourage the tendencies of the Austrian cabinet to induce it to charge me with some message for him. Mr. de Talleyrand had told somebody that he worked a great deal with the prime minister and that he had noticed that he often varied. In telling the reader of these deductions of mine, I only give them as conjectures on my part, seeing that I was never called to the audience to which I expected to be summoned. Life at Schoenbrunn and in Vienna had become intolerable for French people. The police behaved brutally towards them. Count Anatole de Montesquieu was coming one day from Vienna to Schoenbrunn when he was detained at the Maria Hilf barrier by an agent who informed him that he was not allowed to cross the lines. Monsieur de Montesquieu went up to the police office and not finding any explanation of this order went home to his mother to wait for it there. A quarter of an hour later, a messenger came from Monsieur de Hager, director of police, with apologies for the misunderstanding which had interrupted his excursion and the assurance that such a thing would never occur again. In spite of this assurance, we were frequently exposed to similar unpleasantness. Since General Nyberg's departure for Italy, Baron de Wessenberg, the Austrian minister, one of the negotiators at the Congress, acted as intermediary between the Empress and Prince Metternich, whom she used to see at her son's apartment every time that she went to Vienna. He was often charged with letters from General Nyberg. Archduke Charles appeared also to enjoy the Empress's confidence. On April 13th, a religious service was celebrated in Vienna in commemoration of the anniversary of the death of Maria Theresa, Marie Louise's mother, and she was present with her family. On her return to Schoenberg, she did me the honor of telling me that a letter which had been brought by Monsieur de Flao had arrived in Vienna and that she had been told its contents verbally. They persisted in not handing her the emperor's letters so as to cut short all communications between her and her husband. Monsieur de Flao had been arrested at Stuttgart just as Monsieur de Stassart had been arrested at Linz and had been forced to turn back after having handed over to the Austrian authorities the dispatches with which he had been charged. On the same day, the Vienna Gazette published the Emperor of Austria's edict relating to the institution of the Lombardo-Venetian kingdom under date of April 7th. Ambitious motives prompted the sovereigns of the great powers to erect into monarchies the spoils of the colossal power from which they were inheriting. Thus, the Emperor of Russia took the title of King of Poland and the King of England that of King of Hanover. Holland, with Belgium added, also definitely became a kingdom. The Empress returned one day to Schoenbrunn, much upset by a remark which had reached her ears as she was coming out of the Imperial Palace in Vienna. Two men who spoke in French had said loud enough for her to hear, this lady does very wrongly to act as a spy here on her father. She would do very much better to return to France and to live with her husband there. This reproach wounded her deeply, but as moderation was the basis of her character, she refused to have the people who had made this remark looked for contrary to what she had been advised to do. Count Aldini had just brought a letter from Princess Elisa, Napoleon's sister, to Schoenbrunn, in which she begged Marie Louise to use her influence with the Emperor of Austria to enable her to return to France. In spite of the goodwill of the Empress, who went specially to Vienna to ask for this permission for her sister-in-law, her application remained without any result, and no answer was vouchsafed by the Austrian cabinet.